Yeah. So, yeah. So today we are we are all here together, and I'm going to talk about SARS coronavirus two, uh, which I'm sure all of you would have heard, and we are still going through a lot because of this this virus that uh, caused a recent pandemic. I'll talk about the origin of the virus, the pathogenesis, and the management management strategies that can be employed to contain the spread of the virus and manage this pandemic situation uh, efficiently. So to begin with, I would like to introduce you all to the, the virus first. Uh, this coronavirus belongs to the family Coronaviridae. And the term corona actually comes from a Latin word that means crown. And if you see the, the structure of the coronavirus, this is an electron microscopic image of coronavirus. And you can see that there is a crown-like structure around the virus. And that's how the name was given to it. It's a if you talk about the genome, it's a single-stranded positive sense RNA virus, and it is one of the largest RNA genome uh, positive strand viruses known, and it replicates in the cytoplasm. The reason why, because it's a positive strand RNA virus, it can directly translate into proteins. There are four main genera known uh, in this uh, family. The alpha coronaviruses that infects humans, the beta coronaviruses that infects humans, mice, and bovine species, then there are two more, the gamma coronaviruses and the delta coronaviruses, which infects avian species and bats. So these coronaviruses are not new to this world. Like we have been uh, having common cold because of the common cold causing coronaviruses since a long time. In fact, the first coronavirus was identified in 1965, which is like, uh, like so many years back. But I'm sure many of us would have heard about these coronaviruses only after 2002 or in 2012 when we had the SARS-1 or the MERS pandemic, uh, MERS outbreak. So there are four common human coronaviruses that causes common cold. The 229E strain, the OC43, NL63, and HKU1. So they're all, they all belong to either the alpha or the beta coronaviruses. They, caught, they cause common cold. And their symptoms are very mild maybe running nose, little fever, and the person is up and running. It was in 2002 when, when there was a new strain of coronavirus that emerged from the, from the beta coronaviruses uh, category, and it was termed as SARS coronavirus 1. It was actually SARS coronavirus 1 because now we have 2. So it belonged to the beta coronaviruses, and it caused a severe acute respiratory syndrome, which was a very severe... Uh, uh, pathogenic condition in human body because of this virus. We were not exposed to this virus before. This was the first time uh, a very pathogenic strain emerged from bats and it spilled over to human species. The sixth coronavirus that infects human is the MERS coronavirus. That's again in the, in the category of beta coronaviruses. And since it was identified in the Saudi Arabia, the name was given Middle East Respiratory Syndrome or the MERS. The latest 2009 novel coronavirus outbreak that we all know about is the, the SARS coronavirus 2 because of its similarity. In fact, a lot of similarity with SARS coronavirus 1. And that was the reason the previous one became SARS 1. And now this is SARS 2. And the disease that it causes, it's called coronavirus disease 19. And we say it as COVID-19. So if you see about the uh, uh, about the normal uh, scenario when the virus infects, it generally infects the respiratory airways, the epithelial cells of the respiratory tract, including lungs. They count for 15 to 30% of the common cold, and they are occasionally spreading to the lo lower respiratory tract. Airway epithelial cells are the main target of infection. However, with certain other human coronaviruses, there are other cell types which have been known to be infected in, in vitro conditions. Like the human coronavirus 229E strain can infect and replicate in the neural cells, the hepatocytes, monocytes, and macrophages. Again, there are other, uh, uh, other strains of coronaviruses like OC43, which has shown neurotropism and it has been documented in vivo. So the peripheral blood cells from myeloid lineage can also be infected by the human coronaviruses. And these cells have been proposed to serve as a way to spread the virus to neural, neural and tissues. If you talk about the clinical signs and symptoms, it's, it's nothing uh, different from the common flu or the common cold caused by rhinoviruses or adenoviruses or any, any other respiratory viruses. 
But if you talk about the MERS or the SARS, definitely they cause severe symptoms as compared to the common cold coronaviruses. So these are the common symptoms like fever, dry cough, mild breathing difficulties, gastrointestinal uh, issues and diarrhea and, and general body ache. But when we talk about the coronaviruses, the, the last three coronaviruses, the SARS-1, the MERS and the SARS-2, they cause more severe symptoms in the same category. Like it, it causes very high fever. It causes a pneumonia-like symptom. There is a chance of kidney failure. And they're all transmitted mainly through cough or sneezes from infected person or touching the contaminated objects. Now, I'll, I'll briefly uh, summarize the SARS-1 virus outbreak. So it was in the November 2002 when a highly contagious and severe atypical pneumonia was observed in the Guangdong province in southern China. And if you can see, within, within a month or so, the virus spread to Hong Kong and similar outbreaks occurred in different communities subsequently. March 24, 2003, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, Atlanta, USA, those people were uh, able to first uh, document that this is a new virus and it causes infection of the upper respiratory uh, tract and they might be the likely cause of SARS. And you, you can see how how fast this has, how fast these events have taken place. Like in March 29th, Dr. Carlo Urbani, who was the first person to identify the first case of SARS, he died as a result of the disease. Similar to what we have seen in SARS-2, the, the doctors who first identified, uh, they, they are dead now. So the reason is, before we know about the virus properly, before we know how to manage this virus, before we know how to prevent its replication and control our body's immune response, it's too late for a few people and they just die because of several uh, uh, disease conditions. In the April 6, on April 16, 2003, a new strain of coronavirus that was never seen before in humans was confirmed as the cause of the SARS. And if you see a total of 8,098 SARS cases were identified and around 774 deaths were reported during 2003 outbreak. So it was not even like more than a, a year or so. It was just like a year and the mortality rate was 10%, which is much, much higher than any other respiratory virus. Like if you talk about flu, it kills, but the fatality rate or the mortality rate is just 0.1%. And this was 10% compared to 0.1%. So you can imagine how deadly this virus would have been at that time. But fortunately, after 2004, the world has not reported any more cases of SARS coronavirus 1. So this table just shows the, the, the country of or the reason and the number of cases and deaths. If you see, China reported the most number of cases and most number of deaths, but the fatality rate was not that high compared to Hong Kong, where the cases and deaths were slightly lower compared to China, but the fatality rate was much higher. If you see Canada, the fatality rate was much higher. Thailand, the fatality rate is higher, but then the number of cases were too low. So this, this fatality rate is actually not the actual scenario uh, for this uh, outbreak. Like, like if you see the South Africa, they just had one case and that too died. So it was 100% fatality. But again, this cannot be taken as a true fatality rate because there was just one person. It was statistically not very significant. Now, after the fifth coronavirus that infected human, in June 2012, in Saudi Arabia, another patient who was the first patient who presented with fever, cough, and expectoration, he was showing similar kinds of signs and symptoms as the SARS-1. He had shortness of breath, and he was identified to, to, to be suffering from a coronavirus, which was not identified immediately that time. But subsequently, when more number of cases were confirmed, it was then identified and then if you see the signs and symptoms almost 90 percent of the people they were presenting with fever almost 84 percent of the people they presented with cough shortness of breath and almost 72 percent people needed mechanical ventilation the symptoms were almost similar to what we saw in sars 1 chills sore throat severe pneumonia leading to acute respiratory distress syndrome kidney failure and other associated conditions the, the striking uh, observation was that the males were somehow 
showing more infection than the females it was almost like 3.3 is to 1 the male to female ratio in this uh, mers outbreak more than 2400 cases were reported and 858 deaths and the fatality rate was 35% which was extremely high for any coronavirus uh, reported before if you see from 2012 to 2019 we don't have a lot of cases but the fatality rate is very high it's, it's just like 14 cases in 2012 100 in 2013 so the virus is not spreading that fast rapidly and it's not crossing borders as the SARS-1 or the SARS, in fact, the SARS-2 has done, but the mortality rate was high. Sir, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, kindly share your slide again. I'm sorry? Uh, your slide is not visible. Kindly share, share it again. OK. Is it visible now? Uh, not, not, not yet. Yes, yes. So. Yeah. Okay. Let me, let me start again. Is it visible now? Not, not, not yet. Okay, it should come now. Yeah, it, yeah. it's yeah, it's visible now. Your that's okay. your desktop is visible now. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so are you able to see the slide now? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. So let let's talk about the SARS coronavirus two outbreak that that we started seeing uh, during late two thousand nineteen. So in in late December two thousand nineteen, the health authorities in Wuhan. Uh, city, which is in the Hubei province in China, they reported a cluster of patients with pneumonia of unknown cause. And this was something very similar to what China had previously seen during the SARS-1 outbreak. So I believe uh, they would have uh, definitely known that th th there is a, some kind of coronavirus outbreak because the, sim the symptoms and everything, because whenever you have a, a pneumonia-like symptom with unknown cause, you should definitely start seeing the norms and the, uh, the recommendations given during the SARS-1 because this unknown pneumonia type, it was documented during the SARS-1 outbreak, but probably they did not uh, pay much attention to it in the earlier uh, phases. And this outbreak was linked to the Huanan seafood market in Wuhan city. And this seafood, mar seafood market is again famous for all the exotic animals and some, some illegal uh, meat supplies also. So since this outbreak was uh, linked to the uh, Hunan seed food market, there were other individuals who were also found positive and they were all linked to the same seafood market, whether they visited there or they worked there, but they, so they showed some kind of connection with the market. And the causative agent was identified as a novel seventh coronavirus found to cause illness in humans. And China soon detected the subsequent cases mostly the family members of the patients or the healthcare workers who attended those patients and they raised the possibility of human to human transmission now china notified who about this condition on 31st december 2019 and chinese scientists sequenced this novel coronavirus on 3rd january 2020 and posted that uh, sequence on 10th january 2020 so it was very early that those scientists revealed the actual genetic sequence of the virus for the whole world to be prepared and deal with the with the forthcoming pandemic scenario. So your presentation is again uh, not visible. Somebody has interrupted the presentation. Okay, wait. Can you share screen? It says your screen is still visible to others. Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, everyone kindly pin the screen to your screen. Okay. Yes. Everyone kindly pin this screen. 
it will not go off again. Is it on now? Yes, it's visible. Continue. It's visible. Continue, sir. OK. So, so just after the Chinese uh, scientists, they revealed the sequence of the coronaviruses online, uh, the whole world kind of knew that there is a new virus outbreak in China. And I'm sure the scientists would be uh, would be aware that this kind of virus outbreak doesn't stay within a country and very soon it can spread to other countries. And probably that time it was not taken very seriously and that's the reason many countries, they, they suffered a lot. WHO declared it a public health emergency at the end of January 20, but I believe still that uh, till that time many countries were not very serious about, about the preventive measures. The pandemic declaration by WHO was done on March 11, 2020. It was a little late, but as we all understand, a pandemic situation cannot be declared at once until unless we see a widespread outbreak within a short period of time. Uh, we cannot declare it as a pandemic. So maybe WHO decided uh, and did several meetings after which they declared it on March 11 that it is a new pandemic by a coron novel coronavirus. If you see the global data for the SARS coronavirus 2 pandemic, the, the left picture shows the global data for number of cases, while the right picture shows the global data of the number of deaths. It's, it's very colorful, but I'm sure it's, it's not very pleasant to see so many uh, cases and number of deaths throughout the world. The whole map is actually uh, uh, colored. And as of 20 June 2020, there have been around 8 million confirmed cases of COVID-19, including around 0.5 million deaths uh, that has been reported to WHO. It's a huge data as compared to any other virus outbreak till date. And if you see the global data for SARS coronavirus 2 in this on ongoing pandemic, USA, uh, USA has the maximum number of total cases and the total death again is the highest in USA, followed by Brazil, Russia, India, and if you see USA, again, it represents the continent, North America, Russia, India, Asia. So they all represent major continents. And except Antarctica, uh, all other continents, they definitely have the coronavirus uh, situation, pandemic uh, infection uh, in their continents. And if you talk about the USA data alone, the New York state has the highest number of cases and total number of deaths, followed by New Jersey, California, and, and, and all other states. And if you see the, the number of deaths that, that happened during this just three months, it was around 108,000. And it was more than the, the Korean or the Vietnam War that killed uh, USA uh, uh, personals altogether. So these three months were like more than those combined death. So to understand the origin of coronaviruses, uh, we need to understand something about bats and, and how they harbor the human viruses. So bats are among the most ancient mammals and they represent around 20% of mammalian diversity. So why do these bats act as a re reservoir for emerging viruses? Why, why bats? The reason is their food choices. They are either colonial or solitary nature. Their population structure, which is which is very important because they have a huge population, and even a single infected bat can like quickly spread the infection to all other bats in a short period of time. Again, the other uh, important uh, feature with these mammals is their ability to fly. So they can just not. Uh, uh, state one place they can definitely spread it to to uh, larger distances they they undergo seasonal migration and daily movement patterns and again their lifespan is very important because these bats have been known to live for a, around 15 to 20 years very easily and in fact some species of bats they live for for about 30 years so these 20 to 30 years is a really really long time for any virus any bat which harbors a deadly virus and it has around 20 years to just, just take one chance to spill the virus from one species to human species, and, and we have a pandemic. These bats are found on all continents except Antarctica. And if you 
if you talk about the the number of viruses these these bats harbor they harbor more than 65 known viruses known to cause infection in humans so if you talk about these these viruses they are rabies virus the lassa virus influenza a virus hendra virus nipa virus japanese encephalitis virus and and also the chikungunya virus which uh, again uh, we we are not very sure why these these bats get infected with chikungunya virus but then likelihood it comes from the uh, like most likely it comes from the arthropods but these bats are not just the bad bad uh, animals on earth they have some importance and they help in controlling the insects they reseed the cut forests they pollinate plants and their their guano is used as a fertilizer and most importantly they they have a they have a property of ecolocation which has served as a model for our sonar systems so they have really helped uh, human beings a lot now why these bats uh, bats uh, become reservoirs and and for so many deadly viruses and they don't die they, they they are very happy and they just fly energetically so there must be some differences between their immune system and our immune system so definitely the bats have a, a different innate immunity uh, compared to human beings or or any other animals they have a constitutive interferon production system going on and on they have either decreased or absent expression of the pyrin or hind domain proteins which are the major proteins responsible for innate immune uh, response proteins and most likely the viral coevolution has taken place like like all human beings we have uh, microbiota in our gut most likely these these bats they have adapted for uh, for the virus to be in their gut and and it, it's it's a vi virome that is uh, prevailing in their gut for several years another more feature as i told they they can fly so these flight results in increased reactive oxygen production and probably uh, a very high body temperature so this ross production again uh, favors the the replication of virus in them but at the same time the constitutive interferon production and the and the absence of innate immunity it's not like complete absent but reduced innate immunity they help these viruses to stay energetic do not show any infection so they remain asymptomatic but they are definitely carriers of several viruses and or or there is a chance that the viruses may have also adapted to higher body temperature to be in the host so let's talk about the bat and human coronaviruses now so the first uh, deadly virus that was known to infect the human was the sars coronavirus 1 and that time the origin was uh, discovered to be from the bats so they were sars like bat coronaviruses and they did not jump directly from bats to humans so there was an intermediate host uh, host th that was the civet cat so these civet cats were actually infected with this sars coronavirus 1 and these civet cats then transmitted it to humans so that also shows how our very close interaction with with the nature or wild animals can put us into danger or, or danger situation similarly with mers again the mers virus was actually originated from bat but again it did not jump from bat to humans directly they were again intermediate host they were camels dromedary camels so either either eating their meat or drinking their milk there could be several other reasons or or just staying very close to these camels because they are again very very useful animals uh, in saudi arabia so people do live nearby camels so these these camels then acted as a as a intermediate host and they transferred the virus or transmitted the virus to human beings and again once the virus comes into human beings either they just go away or if they are able to have a sustained human to human transmission then the actual problem arises because once human human transmission is sustained it it can definitely spread to many other countries quickly same was observed with sars corona virus 2 which caused covid 19 the the most likely origin is in the bats again but we still are struggling to to understand what's the intermediate host either the bat directly spread the virus to humans or most likely there is a there is an intermediate host and which can be a pangolin so the the reason why i'm saying this or, or the whole scientific fraternity uh, 
beliefs is uh, on this is because the SARS coronavirus two whole genome sequence they align perfectly with the genomes of viruses of the bats as uh, uh, of this this uh, rhino uh, rhinolophus affinis species they are the horseshoe bats which were present in the Yunnan province of China and they showed around 96 percent similarity and later I'll show you that these similarities were also observed with these pangolins so probably the COVID-19 virus or the SARS-2 virus likely emerged from a recombination of viral genes across different species and and most likely the pangolins are the intermediate host but we are not very sure there could be other other intermediate hosts too maybe we haven't discovered them yet because again we we just know that originated from a a, a seafood market and these pangolins are like illegally sold there so we are not sure if pangolins are the only intermediate host there could be other other uh, animals whose meat would be sold in those markets and and somehow it, it, it uh, got transmitted to humans now why do we think pangolins may serve as an intermediate host so these pangolin coronaviruses whole genome had 91 percent similarity with the SARS coronavirus 2 and almost 99.55 percent similarity with the bat coronavirus so you see that there is an extreme similarity uh, of this virus if you talk about the pangolin the the bat as well as the SARS coronavirus that infected humans and most likely the emergence of SARS coronavirus 2 is through a recombination and strong purifying selection these all have been published recently in, in, in different reputed journals and in fact, the latest finding also shows that the SARS coronavirus 2's entire receptive binding motif was introduced through a recombination with coronavirus from pangolins. That that can be a critical step in the evolution of SARS coronavirus 2's ability to infect humans. Uh, let's see the the potential origin of these viruses. So these uh, on the left hand side, the human coronavirus 229E, the NL63, HKU1, or OC43. They are the common cold causing coronaviruses. They were actually present in the animals first. And then since they were present in the animals, uh, they transmitted to humans. So we, we called it as a zoonotic transmission. And once they are in the humans, a lot of human to human transmission started to take place. And then the virus just adapted to humans. And, and we never could get rid of these viruses. And they're, they're with us. Uh, and I had, and they will definitely be uh, with us. They're not going to go away very soon. The same happened with SARS coronavirus one in 2002. From bats, it went to civet cats, and from civet cats, it 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 jumped to human beings, and from human beings to another human being, and and thus the human human transmission sustained, and uh, it the outbreak was a, a huge outbreak. The same was with MERS. The intermediate animal, as I said, was the dromedary camel, and then human to human transmission took place. For the SARS coronavirus 2, the pangolins or or several other 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 intermediate hosts can be present. But right now, we only have uh, more evidence that points towards the pangolins as the intermediate host. And if you talk about the uh, the transmission these red arrows they show a very high rate of transmission the yellow ones show uh, uh, the, the 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 low uh, i mean the it's it's moderate to high and these blue ones show the low rate of transmission so if you see the sars coronavirus 2 they really have a very high rate of transmission here a few scientists they 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 took several uh, isolates of the the SARS coronavirus 2 uh, samples and they they almost did a phylogenetic analysis network of 160 uh, virus genomes and if you see the node a uh, that is the root cluster uh, i don't know if you all can see the pointer so this is the this is the node a that's the root cluster obtained with the bat coronavirus isolate and then uh, the, the 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 circles the bigger circles they are they are the number of taxa and each notch represents the links that represents a nu mutated nucleotide position so as it spread to different countries it acquired different mutations uh, uh, in the in the amino acids which will be more clear in the slide uh, this study showed three main clusters of SARS coronavirus two based on amino acid changes the cluster one which is supposed to be the ancestral type 
which is closest to coronavirus found in bats and pangolins. They are considered the root of the outbreak and they have for the two clusters, one linked to Wuhan and the other to Americas and Australia. The cluster B is a variation of coronavirus most common in Wuhan. That's again derived from cluster A via two mutations observed to mutate slowly in China, but rapidly outside China. Then there is a third cluster, which, which you can consider as a daughter of cluster B. It has just one mutation different from the parent variation and it's spread to Europe via Singapore. So when they, like, like all the clusters, they have some differences just because they all did not spread from China directly, but from China, it went to some different country, from different country to another country. And that's how the, the changes uh, were acquired. And that's how we, we uh, divide them into different clusters. Now, many uh, in, in some news channels and, and many other uh, newsletters, we heard that there were new strains of coronavirus. The coronavirus doesn't have a new strain. It's the same one strain. It's only minor differences. So until unless there is a major difference between two types of uh, coronavirus, we cannot declare it as a different strain. So they just have little changes. And for that, we can put them in different clusters. But there is just one strain of uh, SARS coronavirus as of now. Let's talk something about the pathogenesis of SARS coronavirus now. So for this, we have to understand the virus structure. The, the structural proteins that play a crucial role in the pathogenesis of SARS coronavirus 1 or 2, they are they're very similar in the, in the pathogenesis with little differences, which I'll explain in my subsequent slides. The major structural proteins are the spike protein. Now, I'll, I'll take this spike protein name several times in my subsequent slides. This is the most important protein, which actually binds to the ACE2 receptor. So ACE2 is the angiotensin, con angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor. So this spike protein binds to the ACE2 receptors and they enter the cells. So if they don't have spike protein, most likely they will not be able to enter any human cell. So this, this spike protein plays a very crucial role in the entry of the virus. Now there are other proteins like the envelope protein, the membrane protein and the nucleocapsid protein. They all serve important functions like the envelope protein, they help in the assembly of the virus. The membrane protein again helps in the assembly of the virus. The nuclear capsid protein again plays a very crucial role because they, they are known to interact with the, the RNA packaging signal and they just help in the assembly of the virus with the RNA genome and everything is just uh, exocytosed from the cell and the virus is ready to infect another cell. So this diagram shows the structure of coronavirus and how their spike protein binds to the ACE2 receptor here on the cell. And there is another protein called TMPRSS2 or Tempus S2. This protein is a serine protease and this protein is actually required and play a very important role in, in activating these spike proteins so that they can bind properly to the ACE2 and then just make an entry through either endocytosis or just direct membrane fusion. Now let's uh, understand the genomic organization of SARS coronavirus 2. Uh, now the virus, uh, as I told, it has a, a very big genome. They encode several non-structural as well as the structural proteins. The non-structural proteins are the E, M, N, and spike, which play a really crucial role. And there are other uh, proteins which encode RNA-dependent RNA polymerase and, and many other proteins. Altogether, they encode more than like uh, 40 viral proteins. And this SARS-2 genome, they share approximately 80% sequence homology with SARS coronavirus 1. Now, the 20% difference between these two virus is playing the difference. And that is what we are seeing and facing right now. So I will not talk about all the, all the different proteins here because, because the major proteins that play crucial roles are the, the structural proteins, N, M, E, and S. If these four proteins combine, they're able to make the viral particles. They're able to encapsulate the RNA packaging signal and they're able to, and they have the signal to just move out of the cell. So if you see closely, they're, they're, they're very small fonts. Uh, I'm sorry for that, but uh, I don't have a better picture than this. If you see the nucleocapsid, it shows around 94% similarity to SARS coronavirus 1. 
If we see the M protein, that is again showing 96.4% similarity. The E protein shows 96.1% similarity. But if you see the spike protein, it shows 87% similarity. So they have a, a lot more difference as compared to all other proteins. And this could be a reason why this, this difference in the spike protein could be a reason why the SARS coronavirus 2 viruses are able to bind more strongly with more affinity to the ACE2 receptors. And since they bind more strongly, they're able to internalize well and they are able to have a successful infection. And that's the reason why we might be seeing more transmission in, in SARS-2 outbreak as compared to any other uh, previous coronavirus outbreaks. So why SARS-2 coronavirus is more infectious? OK, so there is a multi-basic cleavage site in the spike protein of the SARS coronavirus 2, which is essential for the infection of human lung cells. I told that these, these spike proteins play a crucial role in binding to the cell, and the virus can enter into the cell only after it binds to the cell. So the binding is the first uh, crucial event for any viral infection to, to be successful. And this pandemic SARS virus harbors highly cleavable S1, S2 cleavage sites not found in closely related coronaviruses. So these S1, S2 sites are present in the spike protein. And, and these sites are very important. They play a crucial role in the, in the fusion and entry of the virus. And again, it was observed that cleavage at this site is mediated by a furin, which is required for viral entry hum into human lung cells. This has again recently, uh, in fact, I should stop saying recently published because whatever we are seeing, they're all recently published within 2020. So, so yes, uh, all these recent data, like every alternate day, you, you see a new paper uh, describing something, something new. And, and we are still confused uh, about several aspects of this, this virus infection. Let's closely look into the into the structure and how it it interacts with AS2 once again. So this is the SARS coronavirus two uh, uh, structure and the spike protein binds to the AS2. The TMPRSS2 helps in the binding uh, in the activation of the spike protein and everything is then internalized and the virus gets inside. Now this is a drug called Chemostat uh, misylate, which has been uh, shown to be effective in the SARS coronavirus 1 replication inhibition. And this is again a, a known drug and which has shown proven uh, results before with SARS 1. And since we have now uh, enough data to, to document that SARS 2 also binds to ACE 2 and, and with the help of TMPRS 2, it gets inside. So definitely we assume that this chemostat will, will definitely block the entry of the new virus into the host cell because it will just uh, inhibit the activity of the serine protease because these are actually the serine protease inhibitors. So they have been like, shown to be very effective in the pathogenic mouse models. And uh, and again, uh, and scientists believe that they will show similar effects in the MERS coronaviruses also because the mode of entry is, is, is similar. Now, whenever a virus infects, there is a strong immune response generated within the body. If we see a COVID-19 patient, definitely the virus first infects those persons and then the virus reaches lungs. They, they bind to the H2 receptor and goes inside the epithelial cells, reaches, they infect the lungs, and then a whole lot of immune response is generated. The intestinal infection uh, takes place and, and at this stage, we just say that the, the infection of epithelial cells, they are in the stage or the phase one. As soon as the, the immune response becomes more heightened, we say it's it's a phase two or acute inflammatory stage uh, where immune cells are activated. And then there could be two, uh, two uh, chances. One, either these immune cells will just help to resolve the virus infection, or there will be a like a cytokine storm, which will be generated because of the virus infection. And this cytokine storm, which actually be more deleterious because inflammation is, is just like a two, two edged sword. If it's in the beginning stages, early stages of infection, it helps in the elimination of the, in the, of the pathogen. But if the inflammation is sustained, it will slowly start to damage our own cells. So 
it it kind of damages the lungs so there is a lot of acute respiratory distress uh, syndrome condition shock kidney injury and organ failure and and there can be a secondary bacterial infection just like the flu because whenever we have flu infection before the flu just goes away there is a there is a lot more chance that a secondary bacterial infection takes place and that's the reason why we are given like antibiotics so same same condition happens with sars cov2 infection if the patient is not able to resolve the infection they definitely face the cytokine storm and and it's deleterious for many of them who just unfortunately die so sars1 encodes several proteins to block the interferon response which is the immune response required to combat any viral infection so we thought that the sars2 because it closely resembles sars1 maybe sars2 also has the same uh, mechanism by which it can just block the interferon response and the the protein responsible for this was the open reading frame 3b or orf 3b that actively blocks the induction of type 1 interferons but fortunately in the sars coronavirus 2 the orf 3b is truncated to a premature stop codon and hence these sars coronavirus 2 viruses are actually susceptible to type 1 interferon which is actually a good thing for us but again this is not the only protein that helps the virus to sustain infection there could be other proteins i'm sure there could be other proteins which would be uh, facilitating the virus infection now another uh, there are a lot of like uh, studies that deal with immune responses and 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 pathogenic conditions but i'm not going to discuss all of the uh, papers keeping in mind that uh, that we have uh, maybe bachelor's or master's students in the audience so i'll just uh, try to keep it simple and only the important papers will be discussed here so this is an important paper and the reason why i'm saying it's important is because because of the content of the paper this this paper actually that got recently published shows that the target of human t cell responses of sars coronavirus 2 in this covid 19 disease and they have compared this T cell response to the unexposed individuals, meaning that they have studied this immune response in the COVID-19 patients, and they have compared the same thing with unexposed uh, people who don't have the SARS coronavirus 2 infection. So if you see the picture here, almost 100% of the, the infected uh, patients showed the CD4 uh, activation, and 70% of them showed the CD8 activation. And if you see the unexposed uh, people, even they saw 50, like even 50% of the unexposed people, they saw CD4 plus activation. And around 20% saw CD8 activation. Now, now it's it's a matter of thought why, why these unexposed individuals also saw some kind of activated CD4 and CD8. So probably because, because these individuals Although they are not suffering from COVID-19, although they are not exposed to SARS coronavirus 2, but they, they are more likely exposed to the common cold causing coronaviruses, which is mild, but they are equally able to generate the immune response. So this, this mild immune response, or in fact, it's not very mild, but this, this good immune response is uh, maybe it's because of the common cold causing human coronaviruses. So it's it's kind of good thing for us to know that these cd4 t cell responses to the spike protein of the coronaviruses which is the main target of most vaccine efforts showed a robust and correlated with the magnitude of the anti sars 2 igg and iga titers meaning that if we have a little bit of activation of cd4 and cd8 prior to sars cov2 infection there is a greater chance that the body will so a heightened immune response in a very short time as compared to when the body is exposed with the virus for the first time so definitely there is a priming signal and this will definitely help like it's not a very very small percentage it's like around 40 to 60 percent of unexposed individuals they were having the cross reactive t cell recognition between the common cold coronaviruses and the sars coronavirus 2. now uh, we I'm sure many of us would have heard about the multi-system inflammatory syndrome, which which were recently reported and in, in very, very young children. And those children who are suffering from this 
uh, multi system infl inflammatory syndrome they their body parts get inflamed and that and that, that can be seen in the different organs like heart lungs kidney skin etc the symptoms may be abdominal pain vomiting diarrhea neck pain rashes or or extreme fatigue so it, it's 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 good to just be vigilant with kids because initially when we had this outbreak it was in the news that children are safe from the sars cov 2 infection and somehow they are not getting infected uh, with this new virus or they are protected somehow with the new virus infection but again this multi system inflammatory syndrome uh, suddenly popped up and and it, it's a concern because they are children they don't have a very uh, strong immune system yet but but their immune system is young so they can definitely fight with the disease but uh, but we have to be vigilant with with kids and another reason to be more vigilant is that we still don't know what causes this multi system inflammatory syndrome but doctors have seen some kind of association of these these children who are suffering from this syndrome with sars cov virus 2 infection or or these children uh, uh, have had a close contact with a covid 19 patient so somehow there is a correlation but but we still don't have uh, a full proof uh, uh, thing to say that this this is a strong correlation we can just uh, assume that there is a chance that these covid 19 patients or or the sars cov virus 2 infection would be leading to this multi symptom uh, multi system inflammatory syndrome in children now let's talk about the management strategies of the sars cov virus 2 the transmission of for for understanding the management strategies it is important to to first understand the transmission of sars cov virus 2 how it takes place so it takes place from person to person we now uh, now we know it very well the main route of respiratory the main route of uh, transmission is the respiratory droplets similar to to what happens in influenza now again in the in the initial phases it was suggested that uh we should maintain a 6 feet distance because it is believed that the majority of viral load is in the respiratory droplets which are bigger in size and due to gravity they will just fall down and they won't go beyond 6 feet so that was how uh, it was suggested that we should maintain a 6 feet distance because if someone coughs in front of you sneezes the heavy droplets they will just fall down on the ground because of gravity and and the person might not just get acquire the infection but recent studies they have also shown that they can stay suspended in air for as long as 3 hours because of aerosolization if you talk you still transmit virus in 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 small quantities so they may not be a very high viral load transmission but they definitely can be a low viral load transmission so a person with a strong immune system might be able to fight back but a person with with a uh, weak immune system or immune or a person with on immunosuppressant drugs they might be uh, they might not be able to withstand even a low uh, viral dose infection so it's it's better that we still uh, understand that a uh, physical distancing of 6 feet is is still required and it's always good to wear mask it's not only uh, for your protection but it also protects the people who are more susceptible like like we we are mask we not only save ourselves but we also do not transmit the virus to any elderly person maybe beyond 60 years of age who are who are more prone to getting infection with this virus there are other no no this was this was all the okay okay so so what about it now right now we have direct mode of transmission हेलो कैन यू प्लीज म्यूट योर माइक्रोफोन सर कंटिन्यू वी है Yeah, we not talking about the discussing about the the direct uh, transmission mode now there are indirect transmission mode like like 
when we touch surfaces uh, in day-to-day -day life, we, we touch several surfaces, like the most frequently touched surface would be the door handles that we touch. And uh, very often we have metallic door handles. So it has been shown uh, in several studies that different surfaces, they can, they can have a half-life of these viruses. Uh, a varying half-life and, and at varying temperature, like, like they may have uh, a half-life of 24 hours in general. These viral RNA, okay, so when, when the, the virus infects the human beings, they, they are known to infect the lungs, but again, there are cases wherein these viral RNAs have been detected in the stool samples. So this is another uh, mode of transmission, which, which is not well studied as of now, but we have documentary evidence that, that uh, the viral RNA is present in the stool samples. So let, let's see about this picture, which is a very interesting picture. <clears throat> this shows, this talks about the RO number. The RO, RO number is the basic reproductive number, meaning that, let's talk about flu first of all. So this has an RO number of 1.3. 1 that means one infected person with flu can transmit the virus to or infect 1.3 persons. But if you see the same thing in COVID-19 case, one infected person can can transmit the virus to two to 2.5 persons. So which is which is higher than flu. The incubation time for if you see about uh, about the flu, it's it's one to four days incubation time, and around fifth to sixth day we see a decline in the viral load if it's flu. But in the COVID-19, the incubation time is prolonged. It's one to fourteen. And probably the reason why, if we suspect that a person is infected, they have to be in quarantine for more than two weeks. The hospitalization rate, if you see in the flu, it's just 2%, while it's almost 19% in COVID-19, which is very high. And if you see the case fatality rate, like the whole world uh, is scared of flu and they know that flu kills. And we, we take annual vaccine for flu. But if you talk about the fatality rate, it's just 0.1% or even less for flu. But if you see the fatality rate of COVID-19, it's it's almost 1 to 3.4%. So it's not 3.4% in all the countries. Maybe in some countries it would be higher, in some it would be low. So on an average, it's, it's around 3.4%, which is still a very high mortality rate as compared to, to the flu virus, which, which generally kills a lot of people every year. So, so I I just talked about about different surfaces, uh, what we touch uh, on a frequent basis, and they can definitely have viruses on it, and we can accidentally have those viruses on our hands, and we can just take the our hands to the mouth or nose or eyes maybe, and accidentally inhale the virus, and and the virus goes in, and once the virus is able to enter your respiratory system, they will definitely find the the proper receptors to bind and enter into the cell. And, and depending upon the immune response, either the virus will clear out or it will lead to a severe disease or death. So if you see the surfaces like paper and tissue paper, they, they, they have been shown to have virus for about three hours. Like these are all approximate uh, timings. It's not that they will definitely be there for three hours because again, you can have different quality of paper a different quality of tissue paper. So this is just a, an estimate of time that that has been documented uh, for these viruses. For copper, it, it it doesn't stay very long. It stays for around three to four hours. And that's the reason in, in many uh, countries and in, in our homes also, we prefer to have like copper handles, copper door knobs. They're much better than the steel ones. So they definitely have some 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 value. The cardboard again can have viruses for as long as 24 hours, wood for two days, clothes, they can, depending upon the type of cloth, they can have for one to two days. Stainless steel will have up to three days. So this is probably uh, stainless steel as well as the plastic and glass surfaces. These may have just for a longer duration of time, the virus will stay viable for a longer duration of time. So uh, it, it's always a good idea if you go out of home immediately wash your hands because you 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 might not remember what all things you have touched before entering your house the first thing you may just touch in your house is the door knob of your main door and and accidentally you can just 
stick the virus on it if you have acquired the infection. So make sure whenever you come back home after going out, wash your hands, throw away your mask. That's, that's very important. Now, again, I don't have a, 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 a slide that I wanted to put here. It was about the type of different masks that we use, the surgical mask or the, the cloth, normal cloth mask or the N95 mask. So it's 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 very confusing for many of us to, to decide what kind of mask is important for us. Many of us think that if we use the normal cloth mask, it's not going to provide protection because Sometimes it's made at home or sometimes it's available in the market, but it's it's cheaper as compared to the surgical mask. And if doctors are wearing surgical mask, then definitely they will be having more uh, protection. But it's not like that. If you talk about the coronavirus size, it can even penetrate the N95 mask because even the N95 mask doesn't have a pore size that can stop coronavirus. The reason why doctors and, and healthcare personals, they are advised to wear N95, because it definitely blocks many other things. Say, for, for an example, a patient visits a doctor's office and the person presents with, with symptoms of cough and cold uh, and, and, and other flu-like symptoms. Now the doctor will, will have to examine the patient where, from a very close distance. He may have to ask several questions. He may have to physically inspect his throat, his nose, eyes, many, many other things. So that will bring the doctor very close to you. Now, if if a person is suffering from coronavirus uh, and if the person is infected, they can sneeze or they can just cough and spread the virus to the doctor. So one one severely ill doctor is, is much harmful for us because one doctor can save many lives. So it's important for the doctors to stay safe and wear the N95 mask because those masks not only prevents the coronavirus or any other bigger viruses from entering their respiratory system, but they also prevent the, the bacterial infection because a patient may not have virus infection. They just may be having a bacterial infection, but they don't. They might not be knowing it and they will just report to the doctor saying that I have COVID-like symptoms. So what if they don't have COVID uh, or, or, or SARS coronavirus 2 infection, but they only have bacterial infection? They can still have the same symptoms, but they can definitely transmit the bacterial infection to the doctor. So it's important for the healthcare personals to wear the mask of better quality. That's the N95 and surgical mask. The cloth mask is generally recommended for the general public. It is still very beneficial. The reason why I'm saying this, if you see this picture, the person who is like nearest to the person who is infected, and if the person is asymptomatic, you won't even know that that person is uh, infected and they might just infect you because you might not know they are infected. So if you wear a mask, you are definitely protected because these are asymptomatic people. They might not have a very high viral load, but they do have the active virus replication in the body and you are still protected. But if you see this lady, she will be exposing herself because she might think that this is a healthy person, but actually she's transmitting the virus to her. If you talk about the two-way uh, scenario when both the parties wear masks, it's, it's, if you see the, the, the rate of flow of these viral particles, it's much less as compared to this. The virus particles would be much less when a person wears masks. They won't be spreading the uh, virus a lot. And this has been recently published. Even cloth masks may prevent transmission of COVID-19, and this is this is based on documentary evidence. So, what was the reason, or, or what's the reason why we still have SARS coronavirus two infection, which is still prevailing? It's still causing a pandemic, and we are not able to contain the virus. But SARS coronavirus one was just gone in one year. They both have similar uh, genetic makeup. They were both very deadly. They were both pathogenic. Still, the SARS-1 was contained in a short time, but not SARS-2. The reason is they both originated from China, but when SARS-1 or uh, outbreak took place, it was in it was way back in 2002, and I think Beijing and all they they started having a a good infrastructure and and a very strong transportation and development in the cities only after they had the Olympics. So after the Olympics. The, the, the cities dramatically changed 
they developed a lot the transportation system become uh, very good they got connected to all major cities in a better way tourism again uh, is much more enhanced than what it was in 2002 definitely in 2019 a lot of tourism uh, is there in china in fact china is is around fourth or fifth in number in terms of number of uh, tourists visiting the country so and, and 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 again a huge population so these all might have like contributed to the the spread of the virus and and there could be other other factors i cannot discuss all here in this time but all those factors likely contributed to the spread of the virus and it spread to other countries in a short time again again the flights and all they are very uh, important uh, players in this spread so let's talk about the epidemiology and and I'll, i think i think we may just run short of time I'll, i'll try to quickly move with these slides so there is an evidence of initially we thought that the asymptomatic people they might not be transmitting the virus but now uh, we cannot say it for sure because whether it's symptomatic or asymptomatic if a person is infected the person is infected they will have the virus in them now they may not show the infection but uh, i mean they may not show the symptoms but they still have the virus so most likely they will spread the disease if even if they are asymptomatic and it is like observed that 80% of the infected individuals were asymptomatic again uh, i i told you that there could be several reasons for not showing symptoms because maybe these people are exposed to the common cold coronaviruses and they still have a an active immune system in the body and once they get sars 2 infection the body is already well equipped with with the immune system the, it's it's well ready to fight against the virus and maybe the young people they just take very short time to to fight the virus like here if you see it's an age wise uh correlation between hospitalization icu uh, icu admission and case fatality the maximum the maximum is seen between uh, am i connected yes sir yes sir you are connected okay yes, okay so uh, let me just put it to presentation mode okay so so if you see that uh, the most uh, the, the category that gets uh, mostly hospitalized or admission i see they are in the over 85 year category or 75 to 84 or maybe 65 to 74 but as we see the younger generation they are they are comparatively safe uh, than the older individuals the reason is again the immune response as we our message jab hi nahi kaha tha na copy paste copy karna is mein se sabhi bola tha na kyunki mere se to ho raha tha is mein even okay now now let's talk about the diagnostic tests available right now so the the most sensitive and specific test available right now is the real time rt pcr test that's a polymerase chain reaction test these are the test these are the techniques that rely on a, on a very full proof mechanism they have a very uh, specific binding sites and they have a third specificity given by the probes so if you talk about the cdc recommendations they will have three primer probe mixes for the uh, the n or the nucleocapsid gene the another nucleocapsid gene and then the there would be a rna sp gene which will serve as a control for the sample integrity because we need to confirm that the sample came from a human being and then they will have a non infectious positive control so these real time pcr tests are very sensitive and very specific they take they, they may not take more than 4 hours because you have to isolate the rna which takes around around 30 minutes to 1 hour depending upon the equipments you have but if, if most of the hospitals or bigger bigger labs they have the automatic uh, rna collectors and they will just give you results in 30 minutes and you can just put a pcr in around 30 or 40 more minutes and within 2 to 3 hours you'll you'll get the results in hand so at max like 4 to 5 hours and you you can have the results of real time pcr which is a very confirmative and sensitive specific test but there are other serological testings for covid-19 uh, available in us the cdc recommends serological tests uh, which is an elisa based test 
in which they they utilize the SARS coronavirus to spike protein, and they do not use the live virus. It's it's killed, and it, they just use it as an antigen to detect SARS coronavirus to antibodies in the serum or plasma components of the blood of the suspected individual. So the real time PCR can give you a a result showing that the person has an active infection. The virus replication is taking place. While if you talk about the antibodies, you can know or understand that the person may be in the initial stage of infection, or the person may be in the later stage of infection, or the, the patient might have already recovered and they have they have the antibodies in them. There are several companies who have developed such ELISA-based uh, kits that targets the spike protein, like Abbott, Biored Laboratories, the Emory Medical Laboratories, and Roche. They have mostly developed uh, their kits to target the nuclear capsid, while the Emory Medical Laboratories they have targeted the spike protein for the ELISA-based uh, analysis. Now, this uh, graph here beautifully shows the 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 days from which the symptoms start. So, from the day zero, from the onset of symptoms till day four or five, there is an active RNA. Uh, uh, like replication going on and the virus can be detected easily by the real time PCR here or the antigen based uh, detection methods. Now from day four onwards, there is a production of IgM antibodies. Now they are the initial antibodies that form uh, in the infection and a little later the IgG antibodies are formed. So if you if you see the, the graphs, you know that if the person is showing Okay, let's talk, talk about this this chart and it will be more clear. Suppose a patient uh, sample is tested and it shows positive for the real-time PCR but negative for IgM and IgG. We may think that the patient may be in the window period. They have the, the virus replication going on in the body but they haven't developed the, the antibodies yet. But if you talk about the second, second uh, uh, line here, the RT-PCR is positive, the IgM antibodies are positive but IgG is negative. That shows that the person is positive till this stage and the, pos uh, the person is maybe at this stage where they have positive IgG, IgM antibodies, but IgG antibodies are yet to come. So the person is in the initial stages of infection. But when all three tests come positive, we assume that the person is in the active phase of infection. They have all the antibodies and the virus is still replicating. But if you see a positive PCR, negative IgM and then positive IgG that shows that the patient is not in this stage in this stage and there is a chance that the patient may be in late or recurrent stage of infection maybe the person already has antibodies and the person got a reinfection and that's the reason why you still have a positive RT-PCR and, and IgG antibodies but not the IgM antibodies. So that's how uh, all the ELISA based kits, they, they give you the results and you analyze uh, whether you are actively infected or you are in the early stages of infection or you are in the late phases of infection or, or any reinfection has taken place. Now, physical distancing, as I discussed, it's very important. And I always, uh, and also I talked about the RO scale, which is the uh, reproductive uh, number. So. If you talk about different viruses, they're all like like not very deadly except this H1N1, but Ebola, MERS, SARS, they are, they are very uh, pathogenic viruses. So if you see the H1N1, the, the RO scale is around 1 to 2 to 1.6. So meaning that one person will just spread it to 1.2 or 1.6 person. But if you talk about SARS, one person can infect up to 2 to 4 person. If you talk about MERS, it can infect up to 7.2 person. Ebola 1.6 to 2, but if you see COVID-19, it's 2 to 2.5. Now these all values are not the exact values because they may differ in different countries. Uh, depending upon the cluster of virus they have in the circulation in their country. So, but but this definitely gives an estimate, and they definitely let you know that physical distancing is important because if a physical distancing is maintained, this person will not be infecting 2.5 person here in COVID-19. Or, or for example, in MERS, this person will not be infecting 7.2 because all these people will be staying at home and they, are, they will be staying safe at home. And if this person is infected and if this stays home, this is the most uh, 
like beneficial thing if an infected person stays home and is not able to transmit the disease to others but again it's important to know when you have to leave home and see a doctor because some some symptoms are really strong symptoms they come very rapidly especially when it's a viral infection it's not like bacterial infection when you you develop the symptoms very slowly any viral infection almost generates a very robust uh, uh symptoms within within hours sometimes so now let's talk about the the drugs or the treatment options that we have now there are more than hundreds of the the drug candidates which are in the market right now in in several like stages in different countries but i'm just talking going to talk about the the important ones which have made their place in the phase 3 or phase 4 clinical trials because there is no point in discussing the ones that have made to a phase 1 trial because almost any 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 drug can make entry into phase 1 trial because the sample size is so low like maybe 14 to 15 sample size and they may just show a random non statistical value in the phase 1 and maybe those those drugs will not even reach to stage 2 or the phase 2 so that's the reason i'm just talking to uh, uh, talking about the phase 3 and 4 trials now so we have a drug candidate called redensivir and and again these drug candidates most of them most of them are not new they have already been into into the market and they are like approved drugs by several governments of several countries and uh, most of them are known to benefit uh, in certain uh, disease conditions so definitely they will save a lot of time if they are effect found effective and they will save a lot of money for any country if they are found effective let's talk about the remdesivir this is an antiviral drug that that inhibits rna synthesis again and and, and the, the, this uh, this uh, clinical trial is being sponsored by who and the gilead uh, pharma and niaid and the location of these clinical trials is in the china and usa if you talk about hydroxychloroquine which is the most talked about drug uh, in today's time but again it's, it's in, in little controversy and I'll, i'll explain in my next slide why but this hydroxychloroquine has been very effective in in the anti it's an anti parasitic drug and it's also an anti rheumatic drug it has been shown to be effective against malaria and rheumatoid arthritis and it has been like it was initially uh, recommended by many many governments uh, and it was also uh, kind of supported by who initially uh, and who again again uh, conducts a solidarity trial in which many countries they take part together and they just uh, help in the in the collective uh, trial uh, together so initially it was uh, like uh, proposed but very soon in fact within within last like few days uh, we came to know that who has uh, revoked the the uh, agreement to use hydrochloroquine uh, hydroxychloroquine in the covid patients and these clinical trials were going on in china I'll, i'll discuss about this in my next slide in more details so another candidate drug is the favipiravir that is again anti influenza drug known to uh, known to be used against influenza it has been sponsored by the fuji film which is again uh, a major giant in china the lopinavir and ritonavir they are again antiviral drugs they are known to suppress the immune system they are they are uh, their approval is again investigational uh, and they have been sponsored by who the uk government and the university of oxford and they are into solidarity trial and multiple and they are into multiple countries at the moment now let's talk about the hydroxychloroquine uh, which uh, suddenly came into limelight and again it lost its importance in many countries so this hydroxychloroquine uh, gained a lot of attention as a promising drug against the covid-19 and uh, to to an extent where the the fda or the food and drugs administration they gave an emergency authorization uh, to use this drug but they they did not approve it but they said that you can use it compassionately meaning that that can be used on patients depending upon the condition of the patient and doctors may decide whether they have to use it or not but fda did not approve the use of hydroxychloroquine that time the drug the if you talk about the mechanism the drug modulates the ph which is an important event in any viral infection 
whenever a virus binds to the cell surface and they want to enter into the cell they have to play with the ph as soon as the virus gets inside the uh, the cell they get encapsulated into the early endosome and slowly they have to traffic through the cytoplasm from early endosome to to late endosome or the late endolysosome and there is a lot of drastic ph difference between the early endosome and the late endosome so these drugs they modulate the ph and somehow block the trafficking of the virus from early endosome to late endosome which is a crucial event required for the virus to to reach its destination and and continue its replication so that's how this hydroxychloroquine was supposed to to inhibit the replication of sars cov virus 2 but we recently saw in, on june 15 that fda re revoked this authorization and subsequently who also stopped the hydro hydroxychloroquine arm of solidarity trial in june 2020 another swiss company novartis they also stopped the covid-19 scq studies the main reason was because these decisions were taken on preliminary findings on very less number of patients initially but as soon as other countries they started to use this drug they found several uh, like severe side effects uh, because of this drug in critically ill patients who were given the, the the drug so some studies also suggested that they had very uh, side effects and in fact they showed no improvement uh, of these patients so there is no point in using hydroxychloroquine but still there are many countries many asian countries they are still using it because they feel that it's still effective so it depends on country to country like few countries they have like in the usa they have completely stopped using it but but i'm sure there, there are countries who are still using it so it's not that the drug has lost it, its importance it's just that if they're not showing any kind of improvement there is no point in keep trying a drug and and just giving a patient a lot of drugs and and getting no benefit out of it so now before i talked about the the drugs antiviral drugs that are in the phase 3 or 4 trials now there are certain human monoclonal antibodies they are also into phase 3 and 4 clinical trials and these are the list here sarilumab they are the human monoclonal antibodies against il6 receptors so we know that the the sars2 or or many other viruses they when they infect they generate a cytokine storm so it's important that that cytokine storm or the strong immune response has to be controlled in a timely manner only then the body will able to tolerate that otherwise those strong immune response from our body will will start to kill our own self it will start to damage our own lungs so that's the reason these monoclonal antibodies they are found effective against the the IL-6 receptors and, and they are probably able to control the cytokine storm. The trial is sponsored by uh, Regeron, Sanofi, and it's it's going on in multiple countries right now. The other one is uh, Tocilizumabab. The, the, the drug is again a monoclonal antibody against IL-6 receptor, sponsored by some other company, uh, Gentech, Hoffman, La Roche, and it's again going on in the multiple countries. It's 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 kind of causing immunosuppression and it's used against rheumatoid arthritis also then lenzilumab this is a human uh, humanized uh, monoclonal antibody for relieving pneumonia now these two the last two drugs are the new drug candidates because they have not been tested before probably for the SARS-2 but these all drugs they are they have been tested for some some other viruses so we know that they definitely have benefit and that that could be a reason why they are they, they quickly made it to phase three or phase four trials so this these two new drugs they are still uh in the in the initial stage of uh, uh like validation and they are going on in in usa right now uh respectively uh sponsored by humanogen and the oncoimmune thing now another breakthrough research which we recently heard like just on 16th june is that and it came from the scientist or the steering committee uh, scientist who are doing the trials on dexamethasone which is a very promising and very inexpensive steroid and these these have been done on one of the probably largest trials done on covid-19 patients and they have revealed exciting results on 16th june 2020 
it was a randomized controlled clinical trial in the United Kingdom, and they found that these dexamethasone acts as a promising, inexpensive steroid, uh, steroidal drug, and that can treat COVID-19 patients. The drug was shown to reduce death by one third in patients of vent on the patients who are on ventilators to an extent where UK government has immediately authorized the use of dexamethasone for COVID-19 patients. And in fact, WHO also welcomed the preliminary results about dexamethasone. So although there are some more studies to be done for this, but, but it's a very uh, good breakthrough uh, research in this field wherein because these, these are very cheap drugs and they are probably available in, in many countries easily. And we don't have to wait for other trials and 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 invest a lot of money uh, buying it from other country or, or synthesizing it on our own. But these drugs are cheap drugs. If they are found effective, they are available to us in a very short time. Now let's talk about the vaccine, which is the last part I'll be I'll be discussing today. So there are several vaccine candidates which are still in clinical trials. Uh, the reason why I'm still saying every time I say they are in the preliminary stages because these clinical trials that take a lot of time, they cannot just done be they cannot just be done in two or three days. They take like months, and they need a lot of approvals from different governing bodies before those trials can be done on patients. So that's the reason they take time, and it's not that they can be just done in few like few. 10 or 20 patients and, and they can be administered uh, in the whole population. They have to pass through several stages and show that they don't have a lot of cytotoxicity. They have a lot more benefit than the side effects. So there are several factors that are taken into consideration before a vaccine is actually in the, into the market. And then again, the production of the vaccine and marketing that takes a lot of time. So uh, that's the reason we don't, we don't have a very very, uh, like near future, where we can see a vaccine against uh, coronavirus, but we but we never know. There are companies uh, who show promising uh, results and who show uh, promising uh, and who give promising statements. Let uh, we will see in the subsequent slides here. So these vaccines are designed to protect an individual before the exposure to the virus. Like if a person is already exposed to the virus, they have to be treated. But when these vaccines are available. They can be given to individuals before the exposure of the virus. So you get a protection before exposure. And these vaccines not only protect the vaccinated individuals, but they also protect the community. The reason, because one vaccinated person will not suffer from the disease. And one person, if they stay healthy, they will not transmit to the whole community. And ultimately, there is a herd immunity that is going to develop in all the countries slowly. And that's how the vaccine works. But unfortunately, we don't have a vaccine yet. No, no antiviral drug in 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 place. Whatever we have right now is just treating the symptomatic condition. Whatever symptoms are presented, they are just treated uh, using different drugs. There are hundreds of projects currently going into developmental stages, but only eight of them could currently make into the clinical trial stage in the in the category of vaccines. So if you see and if you see the different strategies a vaccine uh, adopts, it can be used by making a inactivated or weakened virus. It can be made using the viral vectors, which can be either replicating or non-replicating viral vectors. It can be a DNA vaccine or an RNA vaccine. It can be protein-based, like it can be using a protein subunit, as in influenza vaccines or the virus-like particles. These VLPs are again a promising candidate because they have all the proteins, all the structural proteins required to generate an immune response, but they do not have the genetic material, meaning that they can go inside the body, they can, they can generate the immune response, but they will not replicate and they will not cause any other disease in the body. So if you see these, this chart, you can see that there are different numbers like, like 5, 10, 15, 20. So if you see this color, they are the protein subunit vaccines, which is probably the maximum uh, in the in the trial stages. Then followed by by this this thing, the RNA vaccine, and then the non-replicating uh, vector uh, viral vectors. So they're all in the developmental stages. I'll show more details in my next slides. So Moderna company again, they have a 
they have a mrna vaccine in the phase 1 clinical trials they did the trial in march 2020 the the vaccine is named mrna1273 these targets the spike glycoprotein of sars coronavirus 2 they have already entered the phase 2 trials in early may after the fda permission and they expect to enter the phase 3 trials by july 2020 now another company it's inovio and the drug a, and the then the vaccine is the ino4800 that's a dna vaccine that's again in phase 1 clinical trials and the company could get this this vaccine into phase 1 clinical trial in a short notice or short duration time is the is the reason why because they already had the dna vaccine against the mers coronavirus on ongoing and they already had the platform and things required to make vaccine all those validated things so it took very less time for them to suddenly switch their dna vaccine from mers to sars cov2 and that's the reason why they they are already into phase 1 clinical trials they also target the spike glycoprotein and they also expect to enter the phase 2 or 3 trials in july or august 2020 these dna vaccines again protect against sars cov2 vaccines in rhesus macaques it has been recently published in science and it has been shown that these these dna vaccines have a promising uh, approach to protect against these uh, pathogenic viruses now there is another uh, important or or we can say another uh, hopeful uh, trial going on in the university uh, by the university of oxford and they have used a weakened uh, adenovirus that expresses the spike glycoprotein they have partnered with astrazeneca for this and they have named it as chadox1 novel coronavirus 19 so they expect the late stages trials to be conducted soon and they have and they have claimed that they can deliver up to 30 million doses by end of september 2020 if their trials are successful so we are very hopeful that if this works definitely 30 million doses are not a small amount like it's it's a huge dose that they're going to deliver very soon and the good thing is that their their study is going to involve the expanding age range of people like they will be targeting 5 to 12 years of age range then 56 to 69 years of age range and over 70 years so their idea like screening the the whole age range which has been shown to be infected by the novel coronavirus uh, recently now there are other companies like johnson and johnson sanofi and pfizer they have also developed their own uh vaccine candidates and they have entered the clinical trials i'm not going to discuss all of them in details the key points staying safe is avoid crowded places maintain physical distancing wash hands frequently wear mask because they definitely protect and most of all don't panic uh, the situation is not that great in any country as of now it's actually scary but but that's not going to help uh, proper knowledge is more important if we talk about social media and all other platforms i believe there is lot more fake news being circulated than the than the original or the true news so it's important for people who actually understand the the virology to spread the correct and the positive information rather than just creating a a panic condition by circulating fake news maintain social distance and i believe this will definitely help us uh, combat this pandemic very soon so with this i would like to acknowledge my previous mentor my previous postdoc mentor professor balachandran he trained me a, on the area of viral entry and trafficking mechanism and my current mentor professor thomas gallagher who is who is a coronavirologist and he works he has been working on coronavirus since in several years and has a lot of expertise on that so i'm really fortunate to to be trained with these two uh, renowned scientists and with this i would like to uh, again thank the organizing committee the ggds college chandigarh india mr varinder kumar from the bioinformatics department and the technical team Who, who conducted all this beautifully, and all the students, the faculties, and all my attendees who spared your valuable time on a Sunday to listen to my talk. And with this, I can take questions if time permits, and if you all want to ask questions.
Hello. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Vinod, for sharing a very informative session on the most talked upon world of 2020, that is coronavirus. So um, there are a few questions uh, as we have received in our chat box. The very first question received uh, from Dr. Nitu Thakur. Uh, yesterday, there is uh, in the news that flabby flu tablets are released by Glenmark company. So what's your take on that? Now, uh, can, can you repeat that question again? Uh, there is a tablet, a uh, flabby flu, that okay. is released by Glenmark company yesterday. Okay. So what's your take on this? Uh, I don't think I have heard about it. If it's just yesterday, I might not have heard about it. But but uh, see, right now, it's, it's a kind of race in publication. Uh, even the scientists, they are, they are publishing data with a very short uh, number of samples at times because you have to publish, you have to get ahead of everyone. So sometimes these statistics do change because initial studies show promising result in very less number of samples. But when the sample size is uh, bigger, sometimes we see just the opposite result or adverse effect. So I cannot comment a lot on that. I haven't heard about it yet. So maybe I can go through it. And, and I have my email ID in my first slide. If, if someone wants, I can, I'm approachable. They can just write to me and I can write them back anytime uh, after this uh, webinar too. Okay. Uh, the second question was, uh, since China shares this border with 17 different countries, and yeah. the total, total sum of COVID cases in these neighboring countries is less than the total number of cases in US only. So does it mean it is something related to geographical distribution of the virus or geographical area somehow affected the spread of virus? I, be, I see th these are some of the questions that maybe uh, influence politically depends what kind of decision the government took, whether they took it in the right time or not. Because as I discussed previously, China had the SARS-1 outbreak and they also had the SARS-2 outbreak. So when you already had one outbreak, you already knew what steps you could have taken on right time. OK, I now understand that it takes some time to for different countries to analyze that it's, it's going to be a pandemic or not. But the virologists in every country, they I'm sure they can just have an idea. And it, it's, it depends on the countries like government when they decide to to uh, like release the the orders to manage disease and how they want to manage it. Like, like this is the first time the whole world has seen a lockdown. I'm sure many of the people would not have seen this in their lifetime. This is the first time they will be seeing it. But this was the need of time. So it, I don't think it's, it's it has to do something with geography. I think it has to do with the right action on right time because the virus definitely spread to different countries by, by means of flight or maybe like that. Because we, we had a first case in Chicago. Uh, so definitely the person was an old lady who visited China. So that's how it came into Chicago. So definitely people move in, in today's world. Like we are so much connected to each other. And it's so fast now that within hours, one can just leave a country and reach another country. And, and, and before you actually show the symptoms, you reach into a different country. And after you reach a different country, you then start to get symptoms. So mm -hmm. even you don't know whether you are going to spread it or not. So I believe it's, it's just the right action on right time and not a geographical. Otherwise, you would have seen a lot of variation in these viruses. But we don't have a lot of variation yet. The virus still shares a lot of similarity with the, the sequence that we saw in the Wuhan coronavirus. Okay. So there is another question. Um, why there is variable? This is a general question. Why there is a variability of lifespan of virus or on different surfaces? And what about PPE kits? For how much time the virus survive on these kits? And what is the safest disposable method for PPE kits? Okay. okay. So the first question is how much time they survive on different surfaces. Now it depends on several uh, things. Why there is a difference uh, of time uh, span? lifespan of this virus on different surfaces. OK, so th this can depend on several other factors, like like there could be some chemical properties of different metals that can inhibit, like copper, for example, doesn't support more than four hours. At the same time, steel can support five, for as many as three days. So definitely it has to be uh, related to some kind of properties with metals, which we don't know 
much more in details being a virologist we we just have have an observation that it stays there but maybe someone who is more knowledgeable about properties of metals chemistry they might be able to give a better answer but it's just our observation that some some metals definitely have the virus for a longer duration and if you talk about the ppe kits or the personal protective equipments that we wear say say you wear mask or or lab coats or or any other thing like you, you wear head covers whatever it is you have to be like uh, vigilant that you cannot keep wearing the same mask every day until mm -hmm. unless you are able to wash it like all the surgical masks if you wash them they may just lose their integrity and and they may not work as effectively as it it will work when it's new but definitely there are cloth masks which can be washed which can be reused but you have to make sure you cannot keep reusing it again and again and if you think you are exposed to a crowd somehow make sure you frequently change the mask too and there is always a way how you you open your mask i have seen people even in in in, in us or or other countries in in some kind of videos they wear mask and they lower it to their nose so that they can breathe easily so it's almost there is no point in wearing that mask if you lower it to to your mouth level and your nose is exposed also i have seen people just touching their mask with the hand and opening it or lowering it down you don't have to touch the front area of the mask because that area has the maximum viral load if if at all that mask has been exposed mm -hmm. now it will depend on what kind of people are wearing the mask if you are wearing it staying staying home or meeting like two or three people you may not have a, a very strong viral load even if you face an infected individual but the same pe person if he's a doctor and he's exposed to 100 patients in a day they will definitely have a very high viral load and they'll have to change the mask very frequently so there is no limit or time time point that we can decide when we have to change the mask it's just that we have to analyze ourselves that okay this is the time now i have to discard this mask and make sure you discard the mask properly because if you are exposed to the virus and you discard the mask everywhere anywhere that can just be touched by kids that can touch be touched by your pets and there are cases in some countries wherein dogs have been shown to be infected with this coronavirus so so even pets can be infected so make sure that these masks or the personal protective equipments are disposed of properly mm -hmm. sir as you said uh, another question uh, just a general question uh, why why this uh, virus is not transmissible to animals or does it uh, transmit it through flies and mosquitoes okay so it's a good question uh, why it is not getting transmitted to animals the reason is every virus has a different receptor where it can bind right like like i told about these viruses they are mainly in the in the bats because they have adapted themselves to bind to the receptors on the bat now the bats they have the same ace2 receptor angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor human beings also have the same ace2 receptor but they have differences in the ace2 right even even if we talk about mice models and and human beings they share some kind of homology but still they are different mice is different humans are different so these viruses they adapt themselves to bind to specific receptors and internalize so suddenly when these viruses are exposed to an organism where they don't find the specific receptor they will not be able to enter those cells and they will just get degraded in some time so that's how those animals are safe because they don't have specific receptor right so uh, i think uh, you have covered all the uh, queries so okay. here are certain uh, queries related to like myths about the viruses and uh, there are certain other queries. I think uh, people can uh, watch your lecture on our YouTube channel also. And okay. From there, they can uh, clear their doubts because you have very, uh, I can say, just very beautifully. You have explained everything, starting from the history of virus, its types, its homologous origin, pathogenesis. I mean everything. Uh, even even related to drugs, drugs what are uh, under the clinical trials, monoclonal antibodies, where is the search worldwide? I haven't heard this kind of lecture on coronavirus. Uh, before 
So yeah, no, I thought that it should be beneficial to all the the category of attendees because some might be faculty, some might be the students, and they might not be exposed to all the research articles yet. So yes, I just tried to keep it as simple as I could. But again, if you have to learn more about the virus, you have to get into details. So yes, yeah, yeah. so even I'm pleased to present here. Mm -hmm. This is really, really very informative session. Even uh, we are getting feedbacks uh, in our chat boxes. It's a very informative session. Everyone is closing the lecture. And uh, on, on, on behalf of uh, GGDSG College Chandigarh and Department of Bio uh, Biochemistry, I would like to thank you again. And uh, thank you for this presentation. Uh, okay. Thank you, sir. And we will, okay. be in, yeah. Yeah, we will be in touch with you for maybe uh, future uh, missions. Sure. Sure, I'll be, I'll be happy to be in the collaboration anytime in future. So I have my email ID on the screen. If anybody wants to still ask questions or get in touch with me, uh, they can use my email ID or the Twitter account to just get in touch with me and I can answer other queries that I have not been able to uh, share right now. So uh, it was nice uh, presenting the talk in front of you all. You really uh, have a very good audience and I really enjoyed this, this night. So it, it's, it's almost... Uh, yes. To 15 a.m. Yes. here in Chicago, yes, exactly. yes. and I'm still feeling energetic somehow. <laughs> yes, yes, sir. It's, it's uh, difficult for you also. Thank no, you for it, sparing. It's not you when, you, when you discuss something that you love about it. It's not that difficult because you enjoy talking. You you enjoy discussing. So, yeah, I, I really enjoyed. Right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for sharing the valuable information. Thanks for sharing. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Yeah.